Yo, there we go. <laughs> so I hope everyone's going to be enjoying the church new holiday this year. Woo! <laughs> we uh, like to welcome everyone here to the Durban Village Language Center uh, for the Cherokee Talks. They've been going all weekend as the final one this year. Uh, our guest is Jeremy Charles. Uh, I'll talk a bit about him more here in a little bit. He has to stay up with them, so we'll kind of have yeah, the conversation. <laughs> uh, Jeremy Charles is a Cherokee filmmaker and founder for Pursuit Films. He's a co-creator, director, and producer for OCO, Voices of Church and People. Uh, <laughs> his narrative short film Toju, Red Bird, premiered in 2020 and went on to win top honors at the LA Skins Film Festival, the Phoenix Film Festival, and Dead Center Film Festival. In 2019, he began work on an original animated series in Cherokee language called Inigay in the Woods and is a 2020 alumni of Native American Media Alliance TV Writers Fellowship. He was recently co executive producer of the Girl Scout Murders True Crime, True Crime Series on Fox and continues developing a slate of projects focusing on, focusing on indigenous themes. He is a producer on the Grand Rapids album of contemporary charity music on the Nile Scheme at Performers, which was released in October 2022 and is available on all music platforms. So give a good warm welcome to Mr. Jeremy Charles. Hello. Um, um, my name is Jeremy Charles, as, as Roy was mentioning. Um, it's a pretty good little background. Um, I think that I'm really honored to be here, um, especially here in this new building. This is a, a beautiful place. Uh, it symbolizes a lot of hope and a lot of, um, really, a culmination, I think, of generations of work. Um, for the Cherokee culture and the Cherokee language. And um, I'm just thrilled to be here to help in any way I possibly can um, in those efforts. Um, Roy, uh, I, I invited Roy up here because I'm better in a conversation than a lecture. Um, and also, Roy and I kind of collaborate quite a bit on some projects, um, including. Um, Inigay, which we're going to play a little bit of. I don't know. Is anyone out there familiar with Inigay, the animated series? Yeah. It's uh, hard for people to find right now, but maybe not be forever. Um, uh, also work with Roy and Roy's department, the language, the translation department, to translate um, a various amounts of film projects, and we're working on uh, a secret project right now, a cartoon, a really famous cartoon that everybody knows, and I'm probably not allowed to talk about it without getting in trouble yet, I don't know. Um, but it's been a real, real privilege to get to know so many of our fluent speakers and second language learners. Um, a little bit about me, just for context, uh, I'm from, I grew up in Umaga, Oklahoma, hometown of Will Rogers. Uh, but my family's from Stillwell area, and six killers paid in Scots and stuff like that over on Spade Mountain. And, and, um, and um, I kind of grew up outside the culture because of my, with my mom. And, uh, but I uh, have a career as a music writer and a golly uh, graphic designer and a photographer. In fact, you probably see lots of pictures around here. Uh, the old the Heritage Center, all those pictures. Like, uh, I had the privilege of doing all of that, and a lot of stuff like that, you know, billboards and all that. And so, but, you know, I was doing, having a great time with photography and working for the nation a lot in CMB and, and I was making good money and I was like, but something was empty in my life. And I thought, um, you know, it's, Waking up, going, like, I need, I need meaning, I need to get back. You know, I see my Cherokee people over here, I gotta do something with my, with my Cherokee people. And I just, one day, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get into film. I'm gonna do it. And that person, <laughs> that kind of person who decides to do something and just does it, and like a lot of you out there, and uh, right away um, formed a company. We were then called Fire Three Productions, now we're called Pursuit Films. We're Cherokee-owned, 
film production company, and we hit the ground running and created OCO TV uh, from the ground up, from zero to, to where it's what it's become today. Been really proud of that. We're on uh, season eight is out. I hope you all have been seeing that. Um, and the reason why um, that I felt called to do film and TV is because of the lack of representation in media for Native peoples. And it's also, um, I think we all know growing up, you've got these tropes of Native people, right? Um, and always the story of Native people are being told by other people. And I felt really called to, like, it was perfect timing for OCO TV because um, let's hand the microphone to the champions and let them tell us what they want to tell us and, and celebrate um, the ordinary heroes in their lives as well as, you know, you've got your athletes and your famous artists and whatnot, but it's really also about the ordinary hero um, that, that are in our communities and in our world as human beings. That's what makes me wake up at, in the morning, is celebrating the, those people in our, in our lives. Um, and so, at that time, uh, we, we started this TV and put that microphone in front of Cherokees, and it was a great segue into just um, this new age of indigenous representation that I think that we might find ourselves in. I mean, Mr. Doing Marvel Comics covers and all kinds of stuff, you know. Um, uh, I think people are, for the longest time in Hollywood and on, in broadcast, um, the people with power just thought, oh, nobody wants to hear about those Indians. Nobody wants to hear about this person or that, this, you know. It, we just want those recycled stories over and over again. Uh, but I think because of the work done by many, many indigenous creators out there, uh, I think Hollywood and everybody else realizes that there's this rich amount of stories available that they've never heard before. And that people, the general audiences, people from all over the world want to hear these stories. And you know, we've only just begun in that way. Um, so, you know, what, ask me a question. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about OCO TV. It kind of seems to be the big springboard for a lot of this, you know. Uh, well, I remember, uh, I was on the first episode, actually, so it was, I was one of the guinea pigs for the whole series. And we <laughs> <laughs> should see how things have gone from then till now. Uh, I remember the crew showed up at my house to interview me, and it was and Jeremy and Jen and Sterling Harjo. <laughs> you know, so I was like, you know, now everyone, they've all gone on to much bigger things, so it was kind of cool to be a part of that from the beginning. Uh, so I'd just like to ask you, what's it like being able to interview all these, you know, Cherokee people out there doing things for the community? Because you've met a lot of people out there now. Yeah. Um... And I think it's just one of the greatest privileges of my life uh, to get to know more people in the community and raise the profile of people um, to let their stories be heard. Um, I think the biggest thing for me has been meeting my fluent speakers, uh, the fluent speakers of the Cherokee Nation, and really understanding the crisis we've been in with the language and the meeting all the passionate people trying to do something about it. And that moved me deeply, you know, this threat of our language being lost. I feel like I was just, I just, it hung in the air for me and it just haunted me. And I was like, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Um, you know, I can speak about a level of a one-year-old Cherokee, right? It's not my gift, but what I can do is use my abilities and the opportunities that I have to work in tandem with the goals of, you know, the language department and the nation, right? And so, um, again, you kind of, uh, I was talking to Howard last night, Howard Payton, the executive director, he was like, be careful, he was about to tell me something, tell somebody, like, be careful what you tell him to do, because he'll do it. 
Um, and that's kind of the theme for me. Is like, um, one of the things I'm passionate about that Roy and I can share is, you know, obviously we have to preserve our traditions, um, and we have to preserve our ways um, in a traditional sense, but I also think for our language to grow exponentially once again, we have to change. We have to put things in a mode that is catches the attention of young people. And that's really what I think about a lot is um, what is going to motivate a young child to take up the language and embrace it? Because um, as we all know, that old adage or trope of uh, you can't become what you can see, you know? Uh, I really hook onto that every day. I'm like, you know what? Cherokee people and indigenous people in general don't know that some things are possible because they've never been allowed to do it, right? Um, and that's kind of a thread you might see going through what the work that I'm trying to do is, well, um, for example, let's talk about Enigate. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I know he asked already who's familiar with this uh, cartoon, Inigay E. Uh, well, the name means, it can mean something like wild or in the woods or that kind of concept. Uh, so the idea for the show, uh, for the series, was to tell these Cherokee, or tell these stories uh, about Cherokee animals in a way that's from a Cherokee point of view. So we have four main characters, uh, and the, the concept was, you know, these, they all speak Cherokee. They all, the whole cartoon is in Cherokee language. Uh, we work really closely with the Cherokee language department and a lot of the community members, too, on the, the script. Uh, with, you know, running by people and make sure we're things culturally accurate. If something is sticking out that we shouldn't be doing. Uh, and the other, the bigger goal, too, was, as Jeremy was saying, the idea is, like, you know, Kids like to watch these kind of things, and if you have kids or grandkids or whatever in your family, and everyone does, you'll notice they'll watch something a hundred times, you know, over and over and over and over. Uh, so that was our concept. So we can make this animated series, this cartoon that's as good as something that you see out there, maybe they'll do the same thing. So we, we got the green light to do a series of episodes. We've done, we have a layout for 10 episodes. We've completed about three and a half. <laughs> uh, as you may know, uh, animation is an intensive process. Uh, it requires a huge team of people. Uh, so our team, you know, the core team, was a collection of Cherokee language speakers and artists and uh, other cultural knowledge holders. And we would get together every week. It, this started in a pandemic, too. So that was an extra layer of challenge. But, uh, we got these scripts and stories, and uh, helped with the artwork, some character design, and things like that. And so we had these scripts. We got the translation to go over them, look at them, make adjustments, and everything. And so then we gave it to the uh, voice actors, uh, which in itself is a whole other challenge. Uh, just voice acting in general is hard for uh, you know, someone to go in and do a voiceover, but doing it in another language, you know, that that's another challenge. And the goal to, is to teach Cherokee. So uh, two of the main cast members are first language Cherokee speakers. One of them is in the room, actually, back there, Mr. Harry Ossoli. So <laughs> So he and Betty Frog were the first language speakers, and they were paired with second language learners of Cherokee. So we had two master speakers and two learners working, or at least two teams working together to learn Cherokee as they made this, uh, made this uh, cartoon. And so, and back to Jeremy and talk a little more about that too. Um, let me say, how about we watch just a little bit of an episode? Some of you guys see it. Uh, we won't play the whole thing. Um, this is a full 20 minute episode, but uh, you'll get a flavor for it in a few minutes.
And the next step after that is train our kids to start doing it themselves. And because to me, I always go back, I always kind of point to the Maoris because I was told by the language department the Maoris in New Zealand have a, uh, are really a gold standard for indigenous language preservation because um, what, what they have an entire TV and film scene in the language. They have an entire music scene in the language. And, and I think you can probably speak to this more, but that's what really gets me going. It's like, can we start the process of building into that? Can we start having media exclusively for Cherokee language learners that makes the Cherokee speakers uh, feel relevant, feel proud uh, to be participating in it? And can we grow that and multiply it and create a demand on it? Yeah, so uh, I work in the language department here. I'm a program manager, and uh, when I first started, I was hired to make short little animations for the immersion school that was about 15, 16 years ago. And at the time, there was just a handful of people doing this. So we, our, our animations were pretty short, like one or two minute shorts, kind of crude, just because we didn't have the team and the resources to make a lot of stuff. But the speakers, a lot of them were on board. They were willing to lend their voices. And, so that was part of the challenge, is finding uh, some people that want to help. Because uh, when you think of language revitalization, a lot of times people will just say, well, our elders are dying, and that's it. But we need help from everybody. We need the elders, we need the learners, we need everybody to work together to do this, because it's our language, it's not just like their language. Uh, so it's, you know, it's all our duty to help with this. So creating these spaces and these projects for the younger kids to be a part of, is very important because they're going to be the ones that will carry it on or the ones that decide not to carry it on. So we need to create something uh, to, that they really latch on to that's identified for their generation and their interest in, you know, what gets them really going. So when you have a, a project like this or any other cartoons or whatever kind of media it is, video games, you know, that's where our, our youth live. Uh, well, some, um, some of our adults live there too, but... <laughs> Uh, but creating things like that in those arenas will go a long way to you know, helping perpetuate Cherokee language. It might change too. You know, sometimes people talk about how like you know, we don't say words like our grandparents or whatever. You know, every generation changes, even in the English. You know, people don't speak the same way in the 1950s. There's things that change and evolve. Uh, but we're at a critical juncture now where our, our generation of first language Cherokee speakers, the last generation of them. They're starting to you know, retire, and some of them are passing away. So it's coming up for the next generation to take it on and make sure we leave it out there for people, for everyone to have access to it and for ways to learn and create content. Creation of content is a very important part of this because uh, any healthy language is creating content, whether that's uh, you know, films, TV shows, music. Literature, whatever it is, people are thinking in that language and putting their ideas out there. So this is a good venue to do that, especially in the modern era, to use media like this. So this is things that like Jeremy has been leading the charge with with the language department. You know, he's a, he doesn't work directly in Cherokee Nation, but we work with him on a lot of things and contractors and projects. And so I see him and hear from him quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, to reiterate what Roy was saying, it's. Um, um, Cherokees have never been stuck in a box. You know, we've always innovated. Um, I think you can go back through our history and point to the ways that Cherokees innovate, and they they change with the times because the times never stop, and Cherokees are never stop evolving as well. Um, you know, even going back to the printing press, creating this little berry. Um, so many innovations that Cherokees have adopted and have accelerated and incorporated into our culture. And I think this is something that I'm just really passionate about because, um, as Roy was saying, this is what's going to carry us, give us momentum to regrow our speaker population and make our culture um, living. And you know, I think the greater mainstream is like, always puts natives in this box of the past, right? Well, I think it's up to us to prove that that's not true. You know, we have actors and playwrights, and we have 
writers, we have artists uh, who are all storytellers. It's all coming back to the same thing. You know, whether you're making a film or you're writing um, a book or if you're making a painting, um, you're all telling stories and you're conveying the culture in that. And so that's one thing that Cherokee Nation has done a great job is cultivating those storytellers through all the modes. Um, but one of the things that kind of segue into the next part here, and I'm going to give my notes. Um, as I mentioned, it's really important to me to uh, offer an alternative uh, for our kids to, uh, and if we're going to do something, let's make it the highest quality possible. Let's make it compete. And so I, was, um, I just spent time with you guys, and we just talk, you know, and with Wade, Mackie, and Howard Payton, and Roy, and our other speakers, our film speakers, like, like Harry Oswee, and uh, second language learners, and so many ideas get bandied about. And uh, I'm the type of person who hears something and it doesn't go away, right? And so uh, we were, I don't know, Howard just stopped by in my studio in Tulsa one day and was like, hey. And he pulled up this video of uh, Mallory's music video, the singer, and he's like, we need this. I was like, yes, sir, I'll give you that. Um, but that wasn't enough for me in my brain. My brain's like, we need to create a spark again. We need to create a spark. This is a spark. Uh, I, think, I, I think in sparks, like, what's going to create the next wave of momentum, right? And so we'll kind of talk about how this album, Unknown Dead Man Has anybody heard of this album? Um, so, so at the end of the day, <laughs> Howard's like, we need this. Like, yes, we'll do that. And, and I was I'm going through and I was thinking, like, do we have any Cherokees who are making contemporary music? I know we all love our gospel hymns and our and the youth choir is doing great, you know, renditions of popular songs, but is there anybody out there making music in the language that is doing in a contemporary popular mode? It's like can't think of anyone doing it. It's like, that's it. And uh, so by the end of the day, I had uh, more than enough list of Cherokee citizens who are amazing musicians. And I was like, you know, that music video sounds all good, but we're going to make an entire album. <laughs> um, and very purposefully, um, from the beginning, I thought this needs to be a compilation album because Again, nobody knows, Cherokees don't know that they can, I mean, I think they know they can write folk songs and gospel songs, and, but do they know that they can rap? Do they know that they can play heavy metal? Do they know that they can write Cherokee music in reggae mode? Um, you know what I mean? Like, who, it's not even on the radar, I think, for, and I was like, we've got to make this on the radar, and that's, the same principle as we have taken with our other work is um, give this, make this, make something that opens up the door of possibility, where the imagination is unlocked. You know, and I can be a rapper. I can rap, I can be a Cherokee, and I can be um, a contemporary person because we are right. And so they're breaking down that barrier between cultural identity and relevancy into the mainstream, right? That is, the, that is to me the goal here. And so immediately started working on this and identified our artists. Um, one thing that was interesting to me is that um, we have lots of people my age, get gray here, you know, um, who don't speak, right? I think we've got a you can tell me this is true, but I think we've got a lot of younger people than me coming up who are going to be really proficient speakers. Um, but they, what do they have to listen to? Um, can they incorporate charityness into their lives in all a different way? So we went out there, and I was like, you, you are an amazing musician. You already do what you do. You do what you do. But we need a rapper. You know what I mean? Um, 
And so, I don't know if anybody was here yesterday for Mr. Zebediah No Fire. Yes. Get, get some claps for Zebediah No Fire. <laughs> Sensation. Uh, so the story behind that was, um, you know, when I first met Zeb, he was, he was in here at the program, and a really talented second language learner, too. And I knew him as a comedian. He was a kind of a budding, budding comedian, and uh, he just has a special way about him. Right? And I couldn't think of anybody who rapped in Cherokee, who knew the language enough to rap in Cherokee. as like, Zeb. Zip, you ever rapped? Like, <laughs> what kind of music do you like? Okay, he likes hip hop, he likes like, you know, R&B. Um, you, sir, are gonna become a rapper. <laughs> and he embraced it, you know, and he, um, he, I think he knows, as all these artists on this album know, and Roy knows, and the second language learners know, and everybody that's part of knows is, um, we, we need that, and immediately, I mean, it's, I, I get a, a little emotional when I, because uh, we didn't even release the song, uh, Zebedee's song yet. And, uh, and uh, little Nell Darty, uh, who's in the emergency program, her mom took a video of her choreographing and dance to it, you know? That, that's really amazing that this is what we're talking about. There's these kids that are latching on to this world, this hip hop song that's in Jericho that she just had the privilege to hear. She's already you know, making dance moves for it, right? So it's catching your attention. And, yeah. you know, Zeb is, you know, I first came, became aware of him through social media. He was making these little videos, they were short clips, and they were, they were in English, but they were writing these rap songs and things, and he had this really this good talent for it. And he was, they were funny too, you know. So, you know, for, you know, when people recognized he had that talent, it made sense for him to do this in charity because he was here in the Master Prince program. He still works in the language department. He works down with the kids in the classroom in the, uh, I think, sixth grade, uh, I got the grade wrong, but uh, he's, he's a really good teacher. And he's, he's also in the film too. Uh, I was told a story that you know, he was teaching filmmaking to some of the kids down there. and. Uh, yeah, he was letting the kids make what they wanted, and one of them made a little short film about this historical time of burning, burning the witches. <laughs> so they're like, well, oh, it was a jerky. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see his humor, you know, is kind of there. He's kind of letting the kids do their own thing. Because if, if you try to, you know, put a, a limit on what kids can do, you know, that really stifles them in all kinds of ways. So to let them express themselves how they want to do it with the equipment and the tech and the language and cultures, that's great to do. And so, do we want to play his, his song? Yeah. Um, so, well, we knew Zeb was just a sensation general, but um, this, and, and I'll mention a couple other artists, um, uh, Agala Sieg Mackie, who's also a master language apprentice, um, before we play a couple minutes of this, but um, Chuj, um was just posting, his mama was posting videos of him playing all these old time country songs at the creek. And um, he was pretty new at guitar. And I was like, Chuj, have you ever written an original song? And he said, nope. I was like, you're going to. <laughs> and what's amazing is that um, in such a short time, uh, he immediately grabbed it, and he's, uh, you could have seen him yesterday on One Fire Field playing. Uh, he has gone from no original songs to having a full band, and we're, um, we're working with, with him to create an entire full-length album of original Cherokee music in, uh, Cher uh, original music in the Cherokee language um, of old-time country, you know, and now I believe uh, the language department has recognized that he needs to be helping teach these kids how to write, to do songwriting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's uh, in the classroom. He's a graduate of the Master Apprentice Program just, was it last week or week before? Mm -hmm. uh, so he's going to be in the classroom teaching music to the kids, you know, trying to encourage them to write their own songs too in different styles. And so, you know, we've created this uh, pipeline 
now the language department with Cherokee Nation uh, to from we have a, an immersion school that starts that baby immersion now from six weeks all the way to the eighth grade now uh, we're building a new program for high school and we have plans in the future to hit well we do have college classes but not like intense like we want so we have plans to do that too so the idea is to have a an educational track for people to go to be able to learn Cherokee from six weeks old all the way through the college career entirely in Cherokee and with avenues like this, these kind of projects that gives them a place to actually use their talents and their skills. They, could, they have a place to go. They can write a song, write a script, write a book, whatever. So we're, we want to create these channels for them to, to access and get that out to the people. Um, let's hear a little bit of the Baker, uh, Zeb's breakout song. <laughs> They go plus go. D got to husk gun, dawa don't. They go in a gunning, jito a tea song. Nihi, Japoni, Yoji do. They go in must die, doggy low, it's done at home. They just hunt a del gold, gold plus go. They got a dunk or whoop, it's like you're not. They just don't. Juki jungle, doggy low, it's done at home. So, um, I, uh, so part of this process was, um, you know, I, I'm a musically minded person, and um, if I, I always tell people, if I was able to be a musician, I'd give it all up. I'd give everything up to be an amazing musician, but I'm just not. And, uh, <laughs> but I have been a photographer and I've been connected to the music scene for a long time and I have many, many amazingly talented musician friends. And so what we did was like Zebediah, um, I paired him with a good friend of mine, Connor, who is a hip hop artist, who is a formerly in Tulsa, but he composes films for us uh, a lot, film scores. And uh, I knew that'd be a perfect pairing, so. I made sure that Zeb had the best possible producer, you know, to create tracks with him and collaborate with him. And uh, in fact, Zebediah's got another song out. You guys probably heard uh, Talk, Charity, Talk Cherokee to Me uh, that's been making waves as well. And the same producer, you know, like developing this time, continuing with this momentum. Uh, so on the album, we have 12 songs and... Ten of the artists, or two of the artists, Zeb and Agala Seeger, uh, second language learners, very proficient speakers of Cherokee. And what was really cool is to hear both of them say, like, golly, it's easier to write music in Cherokee rather than translate it from English. So they actually wrote it in Cherokee. They wrote their songs in Cherokee. But what's important here, as equally as important, is the other ten artists. Um, all citizens of Cherokee Nation, all amazing musicians, but none of them had really that familiarity with the music already. And so the biggest part of this was, um, again, like creating a spark. Uh, like Kaylin Fay. Uh, Kaylin Fay is a good friend of mine. Um, she has some language, you know, familiarity and um, but others like, uh, for example, my daughter Lillian Ia, who has the title track to the to the album, <laughs> um, had not very familiar with the language at all. And so, it was absolutely important. We taught when from the beginning. We said like, there is no point in making an album that is not accurate to the language. There's no if you're perpetuating a, a low quality version of the language, it doesn't do the language any service, right? And so that's, again, where we collaborated with the Cherokee Language Department and said, um, and so we, we got our, and actually here comes Harry again, you know, and he's popping up in our, in our feed again because Harry was, also, was a uh, mentor to two different artists on the album who were not that familiar with the language at all. It was a process of taking the song in English, translating it to Cherokee first, and then, as you might know, Cherokee and English don't, they're not 
compatible, right? And so there's a lot of recontextualizing ideas in Cherokee. And then so doing a few passes and then making it singable, which is a, another thing, you know, another pass, right? And then it's rehearsing and like getting it down. So Harry and our other language, our, our, our language coaches, translators would spend hours with our artists and like go through every syllable. It's like, it's like, do, not do, do, you know, like, you know, tla, not tla, tla, you know, just like fine points to every little syllable uh, worked and worked and worked. Some people it came easier to than others. Um, it would, would have come hard for me, but, um, but that was a level of dedication. Then once we had a, a good version of it, then we would send it to the translation department and said, does this all, does this work? You know, and then they would make small tweaks. It's like, uh, and so by the time we got to the final tracks of the album, it was as good of Cherokee as it could be for non-speakers most of the time, right? And what was what's really been moving to me is how it's changed the lives of some of these artists because they were disconnected from our community and didn't have a way in or didn't, you know, didn't don't live nearby or don't know many speakers or but they got to see firsthand they got to speak in the language and to understand the importance of it and because one of the things that I get told all the time is and I've internalized at this point is like the Cherokee culture is in the language is inside the language it's the way you think the language is built in a way of thinking that is not like English, that's not like our material world that we're all in right now. Community and relationships are built inside the language. The relationship with the world, the relationship with everything around you, um, it's not the same as it is in English. Um, and so it unlocks something and it's vitally important. That's why it's vitally important for the language to, to thrive is because the culture is inside of it. And some of our artists uh, really, it just meant so much to them to spend this much time with our fluent speakers and be able to have a connection and be able to contribute um, something to the culture. And we were fed by it, fed by that relationship. And um, in fact, uh, one of my friends, uh, she's, on, she's on the track here, Ken Pomeroy, she, uh, <laughs> we were going through this process of, and I paired her with Kathy Sierra and, and Bobby Smith, and they were just talking, we were recording, we're finally recording day, you know, of the session, and they're doing, vo we're doing vocals, and they're sitting in the room together, and they're like, Kathy's like, or Ken was like, nah, I got this cousin, this, my Cherokee cousin is like in Alaska, and like, I think she's, you know, and Kathy's like, that's funny. My daughter is in Alaska, you know, and like uh, she's coming back from Alaska. Like, you look like my family, somebody in my family. That's so weird, just because Kansas like beautiful blonde, and 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 the Kathy's like, wait a minute, hold on. You're my family, <laughs> and they were sitting in the room together, been working on, and they actually were family members. And uh, what has been special is these artists are actually out there. They are active artists. They're successful artists. They're out there performing songs in Cherokee to audiences who are non-native. And people are, you can see sparks. You can see sparks. Um, Horton Records, who, uh, a nonprofit record label who put this out, uh, Brian Horton, I've got to give him credit because I came to him and like, I don't know how to release a record. But you do. And he's like, and he, I explained to him what the situation, like the idea was, and he's like, Yes, I get it. He understood the importance immediately. And he has been a, a diehard supporter of this entire process because uh, the changing in the lives of people. Uh, I've seen my own daughter, Ia, um, really start participating in the culture more, and it makes me, uh, it's life-changing, literally. These little steps that we think are little steps change the entire fabric of the future, right? Um, that's what I believe. Um, but, um, Roy? CUNY. Yeah. No, it, was, <laughs> it was fun being on the other side of this and the, with the translators. You know, these lyrics would come in and, you know, 
they they didn't have context in terms of what, what genre of music they were. They just saw the lyrics and the translators were parsing out. Well, this is interesting. And this is interesting. And they were like on the country song. They're like, well, this guy's you know his he's lost his wife and he's about to die. So this everybody can relate to this. <laughs> 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 Uh, so uh, when you're talking about this concept of storytelling too, that's a big part of everything in Cherokee culture. You know, our stories, our stories are passed down in a variety of ways, and this is a, just another way of storytelling. You know, songwriting is a universal act of storytelling across all cultures. You know, every culture has their own songwriting traditions, and uh, so it's cool to see this happening in Cherokee in. Uh, new music. I mean, like Jeremy said, we've had we have hymns, we've got traditional song songs, but you know there are times where we need something that's not so you know you know uh, sacred. I guess we need yeah. things that are more <laughs> just out there for fun, you know, to sing along. You know, all this and this is happening. Uh, we hope to see more of this, and you know, we've got music videos and yeah. just growing more talent across the board for Cherokee mm -hmm. people. And what's cool about it too is even like 20 years ago. Uh, if we tried to do something like this, there wouldn't have been that big of an audience for it. Uh, people were kind of take, uh, taking it for granted that we had this strong base of Cherokee language left. Uh, a lot of people since then have gone on, you know, they passed away, so that, that safety blanket we had of Cherokee speakers is shrinking. So putting our efforts into these kind of projects does allow us to make a new kind of you know, weave a new safety blanket, as it were, I guess, to create a new place for our, our language to land. Uh, and these, we need, all need to help carry this forward. And so if you tie it to uh, narratives and storytelling and things, you know, it, that's where everything lives for us as a people and the communication style. Uh, if you sit around with uh, any Cherokees uh, for any amount of time, people just start telling stories. It doesn't matter where you are or what it is. There's Everyone has some kind of story to tell, whether they're funny, serious, or whatever. So this is all ties into that. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if anybody knew this, but Roy Boney Jr. is an amazing guitarist. So if we could start a campaign to get him to do an album, I'm working on him real hard. I got the other band members on board. We just got to get him in there. Um, but the one thing, that, and for example, whenever you... Um, I remember how you reacted whenever, because we did two metal songs in Cherokee, and this is his, Roy's area. It's like, uh, I just remember, like, tell us about what it was like to hear heavy metal in Cherokee. <laughs> well, let's take a step back a little bit. I remember uh, when Jeremy was first talking about this, he called me. I was in my car, and the call came in in the middle of this song, uh, this Pantera song I liked, and you know, it was like, and then he comes on talking, we need to make Cherokee heavy metal. I'm like, this. <laughs> <laughs> so what's fun about that to me is, you know, I, I do like the, the harder edge of music like that, but there's like a certain cadence to it sometimes that lends its well, itself well to Cherokee language and so the rhythms of it and things. That, and so when he sent me the demos of the, these songs, I'm like, this is really cool. Like, to me, I thought it was really great to hear something like that. Because uh, that's just uh, you know a, a taste of mine. Not everyone has the same taste. So you know, mm -hmm. we, there's a reggae song on here. There's a country song, and mm -hmm. there's a pop song. There's all kinds of uh, genres of music represented here, mm -hmm. and I, it just got, it threw me to no end to, to hear this too. As the, as the songs were coming in, I was fortunate to hear them before they kind of came out too, one by one coming into the office and our translators listening to them, and seeing their reactions too. Because all our translators are elders, you know. So to the, some of them, they were taken aback. They're like. That's not for me, but <laughs> but I can see how kids like this. So they were on board for it. And then some of them they really like. You know, they they like Zeb's song because they're like, this guy's really bragging on himself. You know, they <laughs> yeah. the, so, <laughs> so yeah, I think it's reaching everybody though. That that's the cool thing about it. Even even you know, our elders, I say, who a lot of some of them probably do listen to heavy metal. I know a couple that do, but uh -huh. Uh, you know, some of these are grading to some people. Some are kind of like, well, I won't listen to that. But that's there's a lot of people out there, a lot of different tastes. So we need to make something for everybody. And that was part of the the point is, um, you know, something for everybody. Now you know it can be done in Cherokee, right? Now you know you can. You've seen it done. You've seen the cartoons done in Cherokee. You've seen films. I make films in the language. When I, you know, more and more we're going to be making more films in the language, and I'm sure. Uh, our master's language apprentice and other 
citizens are going to be making films in the language, but uh, with music, it's like, you know, if you're a, you know, Norwegian death metal fan or whatever, I don't know my terms, you can do it in Cherokee. You know, you can do it in Cherokee. You know, and the one of the reasons, God has got to call back to this because I remember the very first OCO TV story we did with the Roy Boney. He said something that has stuck with me for almost 10 years now. It's like, uh, and you can correct me. It's like, you know, we're talking about Cherokee art. You know, does it have to be all sacred and, you know, uh, you know, Southwestern, you know, or Mississippian iconicism, you know, it's like, no, it's Cherokee because a Cherokee did it, right? Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, that's always been a thing for me to say. I grew up in a small town where the Locust Grove, and you know, there were a lot of uh, people making art, uh, and they weren't all native, but they tried to make native type art, and there was like, they'd point to some kind of touristy piece of art, like a maiden by the river or something, you know, they're like, you should make that kind of art and you can sell it. And I was like, that's not my interest. Does it speak to my experience as a Cherokee person? Does this look like anybody I know growing up? You know, all this, so it didn't speak to me. And so I just decided, you know, as an artist, I started making my own kind of art that was influenced by pop culture, like comics and cartoons and things like that, and just kind of carried it with me and still going. And as, through the years, people would tell me, so they're like, well, that's not Cherokee art. And, I, and then I'd be like, well, what is Cherokee art? And so it kind of led me down a path to explore what does it mean to be a Cherokee person in the modern world and what does our, how do we look existing in this, this world now? And everyone, you know, we all can make traditional designs and pottery or whatever it is, uh, basketry, we can follow that if we want. There's nothing stopping from that. But on the same token, we can use those influences and put them into something new and keep you know, moving forward. And again, for me personally, th these kind of projects that Jeremy does really speak to me because you know, I like cartoons, I, I like you know, rock and roll, and so seeing ourselves represented in things like that is it's, it's really fun for me to see that coming to fruition. Yeah, and um, on that note, um, I think it's been, I just, if, you know, a takeaway here is, um, again, it's all the same cycle of conversations like, what is Cherokee-ness? What can Cherokee-ness become? What will it become? It's always changing. It's always be enriching, and right? And we don't have to be a thing of the past. We're now. We're modern. We can make Native-inspired uh, Spider-Man characters. We can do anything. We can do anything. Um, and that's what I'm passionate about, is like show the, is like pull away the veil, this is possible, and now we'll just start building upon that. You know what I mean? We'll build upon that and like start creating opportunities for kids, now that they've seen it, and people, not just kids, now start doing it. Um, that's what that makes me, that drives me, wakes me up in the morning. Yeah, that makes me think of something. Can you talk a little bit about your your film Toju? It's like yeah. a futuristic thing. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know how much time you guys have. I'm sure I can find it somewhere. Um, well, so maybe, golly, should I show it? Why don't you, okay. Um, so I had a short film idea. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a filmmaker. I, we're talking about music and cartoons, but that's what I do. I make films, like uh, with Pursuit Films. We work in Indian country all the time with various tribes. Uh, various causes, lots of documentary work, but also narrative work, and I um, I just had an idea one day, it was a couple of years ago, and it's like, you know, this continuum of time, uh, what was it like for the, what are the parallels of a native person in the past and the future? And this film called Toju, it's the story of a, an indigenous woman and it's very abstract, but it's about a woman being pursued in parallel time of history and in the future. And and it definitely has a message of MMIW, you know, like the uh, in the past we've got a uh, some Spaniard conquistador perhaps, you know, stalking her as she's traveling through this natural landscape. And in the future, it flashes back and forth to her a future self, a future native version of the same person 
going through the same actions. She's being pursued by something. Um, and it's a statement about, like, you know, Native women have kind of been going through the same things um, since then and into, into now. But the message of it is near the end, it leaves you with a little bit of a cliffhanger. In the past, we've got a conquistador dude, and, but she stands up and she's like, let's dance, you know what I mean? You're going down. Uh, and in the future, she's being pursued by this cyborg, RoboCop guy, and she has no fear. She has no fear. Um, so that idea, uh, I think that's what Roy is hitting about, is like, um, we can still have our past, but we can also create our own future and and be a part of the tapestry of the fabric of this country and contribute our culture to the future. You know what I mean? Uh, and in the film, I think it's important to note, and I'll, I'll, if you guys want, I can put up links later, but... It's important to note that she's a part of a rebellion. Tochu is. Tochu, Tochu Wa, Redbird, uh, is her short for Tochu. Tochu is short for Redbird. And um, it's important to know she's like in a rebel group. And her fellow rebels speak Cherokee, even though they don't look Cherokee. So the future is native. The Cherokee language is the language of the rebellion against the robots. You know what I'm saying? So to me, that's just it is a subtle things like um, that's what Cherokee can be. Not in this dystopian robot hunting place, but <laughs> but it can be an influential <laughs> culture. Our culture can be influential and add value to the mainstream society. Yeah, and then it should be noted too that the star of it is actually Natalie Standing Cloud, yeah. who's in Reservation Dogs now and other projects. So she's starting to, to rise up as yeah. well. So again, these, these kind of projects do provide venues for uh, Cherokees to get their talent out there. And mm -hmm. that's been the great part about this too is you know, in the past, you know, people, everyone makes this, this analogy and it's kind of cliche, but it holds true. Some of it is the crabs in a bucket thing. You know, like someone's going up and they all try to pull them down. But now I think in recent years, we've all been trying to help each other and raise everybody up. And there's been a lot of success out there. You're starting to see it everywhere too. So. It's good to be to see that and be part of that creative community doing that. Yeah. I 100 percent. That is uh, very very important to me is to find these youngsters and these untested talent, people who have potential but haven't had the opportunity because so many of us hadn't had the opportunity, and give them an opportunity, give them a leg up. Miss Chloe Dayton here, she is an amazing young actor, and we made sure that she got into this new cartoon we're doing. And um, she's going to use that as a springboard. You know what I mean? And we have all these springboards. My daughter, Lillian, right behind her, she's an amazing musician. It's like, hey, I have the opportunity to give you a platform. What happens when you create stairways? You know what I mean? And create multiple stairways for, for different people. Everybody comes up together. And now you, yeah, and you can just see it. You can see it happening, and that's what this album is about. This is what these cartoons are about. This is what these films are about. Is like watching a seed planted grow. Um, I have one more thing. Um, last night, I was over at the concert watching Huge play, and someone came up to me, and her name was Caitlin Stewart. And out of the blue, she just came up to me. I didn't, I didn't know her from anybody. But she's a second language learner. She lives in Oklahoma City. And she came up and she gave me this. Anybody have any guesses what this is? She hand embroidered these for every single artist on the album. And what this is, is you open up Spotify and you click on the camera and you can scan it and it takes you to their each individual track. And this takes the album. She took the time. It's working. It's working. And she made one for Lillian. It goes to her track. She made. She she took the time to make them, to match the color to the album, to find us, to give it to them, and tell us how important that album was. Um, made my weekend. Made me made my entire week or two or three of them, um, because that was why we're doing it. And just to see it working. 
just to see that seed growing um, just means so much to me. Um, it's funny, she was telling me, and her daughter, Vesper, they were with together, and she's like, my car got totaled. And uh, she's like, get my another Nailis Key CD out of the CD player. <laughs> 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 And they couldn't get it out because they couldn't. The head and the battery was messed up. And so she's like, you get it out. <laughs> and they, like, tore her stereo out of her car, of her wrecked car, to get the CD that was in her car out. Like, that's the level of passion that we can inspire for our own culture um, if we just create those stair steps. Um, yeah. You want to do questions or something? We can take some questions if anyone has any. We need to wrap up here. One of my professors said uh, in our English comp, we had to do a research paper. And me, I was trying to find an easy way out. I said, well, I guess I'll do a research on Sequoia. She turns around and said, Mr. Osui, you could do more than that. She said, everybody's known Sequoia, his history. So she goes, why don't you do a research on your language. I mean, who ever thought of that? I never even considered doing a research on, on my language. And I asked the professor, I said, what do I do? I mean, what kind of research do I do on a language? And she said, do research on the verb, the verb to see and compare it to the Cherokee language to see. Since your language is versed in verbs, you might see the difference to see what you can find out. And me, I'm always up for a challenge when somebody says, maybe you should do this. I, I said, well, let me think about this. So sure enough, I decided, well, maybe I should. That was one of the hardest research I'd ever done in my academic uh, pursuits. Because I never really thought about our language as something different, except that I knew the, the language. Never looked at it from, from what I call a scientific perspective, from English perspective, the non-English worldview, so to speak. So when I started doing research, man, it was hard to do because I wasn't that proficient in English itself, you know. So I was trying to figure out how should I go about this. And it took the whole semester in several universities that I had to go to to research the information that I needed. But I got it done. And that was the beginning of my work with the language, uh, Cherokee language. And that was the first time I met uh, Durbin Feelings. He had just completed the dictionary with uh, Dr. Polte. And he came up to me and said, um, so we started conversing in Turkey. And he said, you know, if I'd known you were working on this uh, project, I could have used that information. And my response was, if I'd known you were doing what you were doing here with the dictionary, I would have allowed you to use my information. So from that point on, we started collaborating for, on different projects. And I worked with uh, Mrs. Kilpatrick. I don't know how many of you know uh, Kilpatrick's they were uh, forerunners of language and history, writing books and so forth. I didn't know she was that famous at the time. She'd already written books and whatnot. But I was working with her at Bacon College with the Cherokee Language Program. Then I got drafted, and I ended up working with an, uh, a national, uh, well, it's called it the um, Institute of American, uh, well, Defense Language Institute, West Coast, Monterey, California. And they have all kinds of language uh, 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 schools there from all branches of service. And I ended up in the uh, 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 East Salawi Division of the language programs. But 
making a long story short, I worked with a lot of people that were involved with the language over the years, from the uh, Kilpatricks to Agnes Cowan to uh, uh, Hastings Shades, all the people that are involved with the, uh, the language over the years. And this is the first time I've really seen an initiative that's different. I mean, we talked about this in the past. We just didn't have the, the technology. And we didn't have the people that were interested in doing these things. And I kept harping, we need to do these different, uh, different projects over the years. But there again, like uh, Ro was saying, people had different ideas back then, you know. Oh, the language is still alive. It's, it's still here. And that was me. I, I also thought, well, it's still healthy. I speak it. My family speaks it. But outside our family, immediate family, the language has slowly been lost, you know. So over the years, I've been really um, looking at it from what I call the, uh, again, the Western worldview to try to understand our language from that perspective, how I can help the non speakers to speak because when you think about the language Roy hit it on the head he said I, I was German I guess he said uh, people see a, have a bit different perspective when they grow up with the language when they grow up with the uh, traditional setting you see the world totally different each things that you see has a meaning the words each word has a unique meaning you know, it's like I was uh, one time I had a class at Northeastern where I was using two words for one thing. And I realized, well, I didn't. One of the students said, hey, how come you use this word here and use this word over here? You talk about wit. And again, as a fluent speaker, you don't see those things. You know, you just know they're there. But if you look at it from the English perspective or Western worldview perspective, then you kind of think, wow, I understand why these people are asking these questions because they've never really understood the language and why it works that way. And me being a speaker, I never thought of it that way either. I just look at it as that's our language, you know. But when I started looking at it from the academic setting, academic approach, linguistically, grammatically, then I realized, hey, we need to find new ways to teach this to our students. Going back to that word, it was the word wit. Wit. One sentence I used, gadulida. Gadulida. In other words, I used katanehi. And when that student asked me what the difference, I said, well, gosh, never thought of that. They both mean wit. So I had to stop and stop my class and let me ponder this for a few seconds. So I write the words down. In syllabary form, phonetic form, and I kept looking at it, kept staring at it, I kept repeating the words. It finally hit me. Oh, I see now. Gatane, gatulid. I looked at the first two syllabaries. Of the words, gadu, 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 on top. Gada, gadu lida. Gada means dirt. So when you look at those two words, gada ne, it's sweat on top. It doesn't penetrate. Gadu lid hits the shirt. It does penetrate. So gada, when the rain hits a, a, a wet. Raindrop hits dirt, it sinks, it sinks in. But if it's a, it's a surface that's hardened, it just stays on top. So that's how you distinguish the uses of the word gadulida, gadanehi. So I said, wow. To me, that was a really a unique understanding of why our language is so, so precise. And I took that to uh, uh, Wyman and uh, to uh, Durbin and to uh, Anderson, Dr. Anderson, our linguistic at the time, and we discussed that and realized, wow. And they, they never really made that con connection either until we started discussing it. And then, then we started looking at other words. And we found out that, man, our language, we know why people say it's precise. 
But it's people like Roy and uh, uh, <laughs> I keep forgetting that what, uh, that, that what the work they're doing is unique approach to language learning. You know, we got to go beyond just everyday un uh, mundane things that we do. We got to experiment. That's something we've always, I've always talked about. Let's do this. Let's do that. I've written poetry in the past, essays and short stories, things like that. And to me, that was a, a way to engage the yeah, large population, people like you, second language learner, those that never grew up in the, uh, the uh, traditional setting. Some of you may have never heard a Cherokee word, but you're Cherokee. But we have to find ways to teach you the language because it's, very, it's, it's our, our world when we talk in the language. I think it was uh, James, uh, Jeremy that said, you see the world in different perspective. And you do. You know, you see it totally different, how we're connected to everything about us from the very small, minute thing to the universe. But people like these guys, they're in the forefront of what we should be doing today. That should have been done 20, 30 years ago. I've been working with language since, like I said, since 1968 as far as trying to find ways to, to uh, preserve it or uh, keep it going. And it's difficult. You run to walls, you run into people that don't believe what you're doing, what you're saying. Can't be done. I've heard everything the last 60 years. Every excuse, everything that you can think of. But I've always kept going. There's a lot of people like myself out there that's worked with the languages. You don't see them out here a lot of times. They're, they're out there in the community. People like myself who are speakers. But they, they understand that the importance of who we are and how we're connected to the language itself. And what these guys are doing is a way, I think, another approach to making it more accept accessible to people like you to, to, to learn it, you know. And I applaud what they're doing because I can't do that. Technology, I, I don't have any knowledge of tech stuff, you know. But these young people do. And that's a, a future of our language, I think, is going through all these different technological advances that we have. And storytelling has always been our way of preserving and keeping our culture and language alive. And this is just another form of storytelling medium what, that they're using. And I think they need to be applauded for what they're doing. It's something that's been long needed to do. But I do respect what they do because, again, like I said, I could never have done that. Still can't. Back then, we didn't have technology, but now we do. And it's global. It's just not local. So it's a really, I think, important to follow their lead and work with it. That's about it. Uh, um, I just want to say that uh, we cannot do it without you, Harry. And we can't do it without our other fluent speakers. Um, I guess we probably need to cut it. Is it uh, I know there was another question. Yeah, another question back yeah. here. Who was, I think in the very back. Yeah, pretty much everything you said, there are things in the works. Uh, uh, there's a video game, several video game projects in the works. Uh, a couple of smaller apps have been released, but we're actually looking at full-fledged video games like on PlayStation and Xbox and things like that. Uh, actually featuring the Inagei characters from the cartoon we saw. 
Yeah, Harry's the voice on that too, so we rely on him for a lot of things. <laughs> and then, you know, Roy is a comic artist and he has a, a new book out, by the way, that is a graphic novel. It's all in Cherokee. It's about Cherokee. And there are people on TikTok and things like that that are putting out their content. Like, like Zebediah puts his content on the social media avenues, and he's doing it in Cherokee and in English. And there are other people out there who's starting to do things. And what's been cool about it is uh, the last, I would say, 20 years, I guess, that's, that's always kind of my go-to point because that's kind of when I got started with some of this. Uh, the language community was really small in terms of who's working on things, so you kind of knew who was doing what. Now there's so many people creating things out there, you don't know who they all are anymore. There's a lot of people that have gotten on board and trying to make content, so it's good to see that out there. And that's exactly, so you need to be TikToking, young man. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? Yeah, yeah that, that's a good question too. That's a big challenge actually. Uh, we struggle with that all the time just here in the language department itself. You know, we create a lot of content. Uh, we put it out there. And some of it gets lost into the ether. You just put it out there, and there it goes. So we do need a better way to unify or actually get the word out. And I think a big part of that is uh, it's got to be community engagement. Uh, you know, at the government level of Cherokee Nation, we can go out there and kind of do this stuff. But it also requires the, the community itself to be engaged and start following this and to start using hashtags or whatever, you know, when you make a post to tag it with this. And people do that, too. I'm starting to see a lot more celebrity hashtags on social media. So you can search, you know, by, like, Jalagi uh, Ayehli, which is Cherokee Nation. And you'll, but you'll see it in syllabary or, like, Gowen Histi. You start seeing these hashtags in the language out there. So I think things more like that, too, will help people be more connected. But it is a challenge, and we, we need to figure out how to do that better. Well, um... I'll talk to you later because I got ideas about that. But <laughs> I think just, just make sure you just let me do it and it'll happen. No, um, I think this is the next step. This is what we'll leave you with. That is the next step. This nation can only do so much and only should do so much. The next step is all the second language learners and the speakers doing it on their own and not relying on the nation to do it, and it, that is, it's a leap, but that is absolutely the next step. We, people making music in Cherokee and not needing help with it, you know what I mean? That's where we're headed, and that's exactly what we need for the language. Wado, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk.